Hi everyone, Neuralart here. Today I'm going to be talking about power inverters. Normally I'm fixing something, taking something apart, describing how it works. Today there's not going to be any of that. I'm just going to show you a portion of my collection of power inverters from smallest to largest and uh, describe a little bit about each one. And for any of you who might be in the market to purchase a power inverter, this could be of interest. Now when I say power inverter, most of you who are watching this video already know what I mean. But that is a pretty generic term, isn't it? Power inverter? Couldn't they have come up with something a little bit more original? Well, electrically speaking, a power inverter is simply any device that converts direct current, such as what you get from a standard automotive car battery here, into alternating current, like what you get out of a wall outlet anywhere in your house. But there's also quite a few different applications where inverters come into play. I'm not going to go into all of them, but I will show you just one example here. One of the more common applications for inverters that we're all familiar with are LCD televisions and monitors like this one here. They traditionally have used CCFL technology to backlight the display. Today increasingly they're going toward LED backlighting. Uh, in fact it's not actually backlighting, it's edge lit in most cases. LED backlighting allows display manufacturers to do away with this inverter technology altogether and allows them to pretty much run their backlight off of the internal power supplies that already exist inside their products. And I'm going to let you in on a little industry secret here. The reason that the marketing departments of these companies push LED backlighting for their LCD products so hard is not because it's a better technology, it's because it is significantly cheaper for these companies to produce. Saving costs on your product and advertising as a feature to a customer happens all the time. Anyway, let's try not to get too far off track here. So, I am not talking about the inverter technology that's used in these products, so I'll set this aside. What I am talking about is this type of inverter technology. This happens to be a little 400 watt inverter. It's the first one that I'm going to cover. And uh, this just takes ordinary battery voltage, like you'd have in your car, 12 volts. Runs it through some cables and it converts it to uh, AC power in these outlets. It also has a uh, a little USB outlet here too, but that's beside the point right now. So this is the type of inverter that I'm going to be talking about. But before I get into the inverters themselves, I just want to spend a minute or two and talk about the word itself, inverter. It's always seemed odd to me. It's like, we should have a better word for it than just inverter. It's such a generic term. Well, if you trace the lineage of this word back to where it first originated, uh, like most things in the English language, it, it actually makes sense. So, let's start with that. Let's for a moment go back to the late 1800s and early 1900s, when the electricity industry was still in its infancy. Back then, people didn't really know what to make of this new technology, and understandably so, they had never seen anything like it. <clears throat> At the time, most people just thought of electricity as an alternate way of providing lighting. Back then, you had, aside from the sun, of course, really only two sources of light. One was gas and usually only wealthy people or, or municipalities had this, and two was oil, or what we would call kerosene today. Now, they both had their problems. For one, the gas that they used was not artificially scented, like we have today, so that was a major hazard, and you can imagine that pipes back then were very leaky. And two, kerosene. The oil industry back then was very poorly regulated. To refine crude oil into kerosene at that time, they pretty much just distilled it, and you got a fraction of a certain weight that they sold as oil for lamps, and you got a fraction of a certain weight that was a waste product. Today we call that gasoline, but back then they had no idea what to do with this volatile, dangerous stuff. It would explode, it would, it would burn, they, they didn't know what to do with it, you can't use it in a wick. So what did they do? Well, they just dumped it on the ground or dumped it into the rivers. Well, it didn't take too long for some of the more unscrupulous vendors to realize that if they take a little bit of this gasoline, kind of mix it in to their kerosene, and then sell that kerosene, they can increase their profits. They got more product to sell, and they have less waste to dispose of. And uh, unfortunately, if you mix too much gasoline in with it, you end up with flare-ups in your lamps. And uh, how do you put out an, a flared-up lamp? Well, you can't put water on it, we all know that. So that was a major problem when you lived in a drafty old wood house with really no firefighting service to speak of. And uh, worst case, the lamp would outright explode. And both of these things happened quite often back then. This was, was a major hazard. So 
people really like the idea of having an alternate, safe, clean form of lighting. And that's really how the electricity industry started. Um, another little tidbit for you is uh, the name Standard Oil. That actually came from Standard Oil being a standard of quality. That's a large part of how they got so big. If you bought Standard Oil back then, you know you got safe oil to bring. Anyway, back to electricity. Today, here in the United States, we have 60 Hertz AC power, in fact, in all of North America. There are three different power grids in the United States. There's an Eastern grid, a Western grid, and a Texas grid, because Texas always has to be special. But in any case, back then, there was no such thing. There was no standardization. There was AC power, there was DC power, there was different voltages, there's all kinds of different standards. Wealthy individuals had their own power plants. Every municipality had their own power plant, and uh, nobody really got along. There were hundreds, even thousands of different power grids, and nobody really knew what the best system was. The conflict that most people remember today is that between AC and DC, or Tesla versus Edison. Uh, in my mind, it's, that's really an oversimplification. What it was, was an industrial conflict between the Edison Electric Company and Westinghouse, which was pushing the AC system at the time. Today, what most people remember is the Edison versus Tesla controversy and, uh, for example, how Edison electrocuted an elephant, Topsy, in front of a live audience. Um, of course, what most people forget is that Topsy was already sentenced to death for killing a, a number of different trainers. And uh, originally they had proposed hanging, but the Humane Society or some animal rights organization uh, said that they couldn't do that, so they're trying to find another way to execute this elephant. And Edison stepped in and said, hey, I've got a way. I'm going to use Westinghouse's AC power to demonstrate how dangerous it is. And then before he was executed, he was actually fed poisonous carrots, and they also used 6,600 volts instead of what was actually distributed to houses. But anyway, I'm trying not to get off too far off topic here. So at the time, there were a lot of different standards for power. The two that are most important is DC, and which came first, and AC. And at the time, both had their different benefits. Um, today, since history is written by the winners, we look at our power grid all around us and we say, oh, AC is the clear winner, that was the best technology. But really, at the time, there was no clear best technology. It was just an industrial conflict. And uh, even today, if you want to get technical about it, DC is the most efficient way to transmit power over long distances. And increasingly, there are more and more DC power lines, high voltage, long distance DC power lines for that reason. Um, especially underwater, DC is really the only way to do it, economically. But uh, anyway, now if I were talking about inverters back in the 1920s, I would be talking about something like this, a rotary inverter. This happens to be an old electric motor made by General Electric, but the principle is pretty much the same. And there were two ways that they could set these up at the time. You could either have a motor on one side, converting that electrical power, be it DC or AC, into rotational energy, mechanical energy, and then a separate generator over here. That's the most flexible way to do it. You can take any power for the input and generate any power for the output, pretty much without limitation. Or, what was more common at the time, because it was less expensive, smaller, and more efficient, was to use what they called just a rotary converter. <clears throat> And that would be uh, basically a motor with no input or output shaft, and it would spin, self-commutate, and uh, the most common application for it was to convert AC power into DC power, because DC power came first, and that's what more people wanted. So they were pretty common for converting to DC power. In the 1930s, they came out with uh, a mercury arc rectifiers, which uh, started to do away with these, with these rotary converters, which required a lot of maintenance. And later in the 1960s and 70s, solid-state electronics pretty well took over this entirely. And now we use diodes and IVGTs and, and other such technologies. But back then, if you wanted to make a power converter, this was the way to do it. So the most common application was AC power in and DC power out. And they called that a rotary converter, or simply a converter for short. Now, what happens if you want to make AC power? Let's say you have DC power in and you want AC power out. Well, this exact same machine can do that job too. You just reconfigure it a little bit and you feed it DC and you get AC out. But it's the opposite of a converter, so they call it an inverter. 
And that's where the term inverter came from. And that term stuck. So now we call anything that takes a DC input and converts it into AC a power inverter. And that's where that term came from. So these also had applications converting AC to AC. But uh, in any case, that's enough of a history lesson. So let's take a look at some inverters. Now converting from AC to DC is quite a bit easier than converting from DC to AC. And it took quite a long time to do away with these entirely for that reason. And uh, today we use power electronics to do that same goal. This happens to be the, uh, the internal guts of a 1500 watt power inverter, 12 volts DC to 120 volts AC. And uh, I'll show you the actual inverter this came out of later. But uh, that, was, that was a difficult job. Also at the time it was very difficult to convert between different AC voltages. Uh, people don't really realize that transformer technology back then was not very good. Uh, today we use laminated high silicon steel, uh, anodized laminated high silicon steel uh, cores in our transformers. Those were technologies they didn't have at the time. And uh, transformers were notoriously inefficient at that time. In any case, that's enough of a history lesson, so let's take a look at some inverters. Alright, so that intro got way out of hand, and I apologize. So what I'm going to do is split this into two videos, one being the one that you just watched, and two, I'm going to cut the BS and get right to it and cover 12 different power inverters and give you a few of my thoughts on each one. 